I fucking love the Orange Walk, actually. I love it, man. There aren't a lot of things left in life that make me feel handsome. <laughs> I'm a loyal Ulster orange man Just come across the sea And for singing and for dancing Sure I hope that I'll please ye I can sing or dance with any man As I did in days of yore and it's on the twelfth I love to wear the sash my father wore. The sash my father wore by Richard Hayward and the loyal sons of William. An orange marching band. Well, it wasn't all, all that of a, much of an unusual sight in the Liverpool of my childhood. I, I can still hear it the thumping of those big drums and the wailing of the pipes, and I can still see the elaborate, often very beautiful banners and the men in bowler hats, yes, bowler hats and white gloves and orange sashes. And it all testified to a belief system, a coherent view of a world of which I had little or no knowledge. How did being a member of the Orange Order affect their friendships, their, their social lives, their, their leisure activities, their everyday rituals? What I lacked was an inside story of Orange Protestantism. And that's now been provided in wonderfully full measure by Joseph Webster, whose five-year, yes, five-year ethnographic investigation into the Orange Order in Scotland is now published as The Religion of Orange Politics, Protestantism and Fraternity in Contemporary Scotland. Well, Joseph Webster, who lectures in the study of religion at the University of Cambridge, now joins me. Joseph, just tell me a little bit, first of all, about the, the origins of the Orange Order in Scotland. and How, how, it, how did it come over from Northern Ireland? So, so the Orange Order really moved from Ireland to Scotland in the late 1700s. Um, and this was as a result of... Scottish regiments who had been posted in Ireland, having encountered Orangism there, and then when they returned home, they obtained uh, warrants from Orange Lodges in Ireland to set up their own uh, meetings back home in Scotland. However, it was actually only by the mid-1800s that Scottish Orangism became uh, numerically strong, and this was because of mass Irish migration to Scotland as a result not only of the Great Famine in Ireland as a uh, push factor but also the pull factor of rapid industrialization in the west of Scotland. So this meant large numbers of uh, Protestant uh, men were migrating from Ireland to Scotland and uh, set up or joined existing Orange Lodges and as a result, Orangism became a flourishing phenomenon. I know the Orange Order is Scotland's largest Protestants-only fraternity. I mean, what would you say defines the order in terms of the core set of beliefs? And more critically, I mean, to what extent do they mirror or differ from those in Northern Ireland? Can I learn all I need to know about the Orange Lodge from your study of it in Scotland? In Scotland, Orangism is an entirely uh, working-class phenomenon, whereas in Northern Ireland... Certainly throughout its history and even to the present day, it has a significant middle class membership. So as a result of this class difference, Orangism in Scotland is generally regarded as more trenchant, uh, more militant in its expression of loyalism. However, there are still very important similarities between uh, Northern Irish and Scottish Orangism, the most obvious being... In Scotland, like in Northern Ireland, it is an ultra-Protestant and ultra-British unionist organisation. It's very pro-monarchy. And of course, as a result of its pro-Protestant stance and its ultra-British stance in Scotland, the Orange Order also has a significant 
negative views about the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. I was surprised by the range of ideological viewpoints you encountered. I would have expected these people perhaps to be conservative Protestants, but you met evangelical Protestants, you met some staunch Tories, some supporters of the Labour Party, uh, some went into the Orange Order because of footballing loyalties um, or because of its Masonic-style ritual, uh, and some Orangemen were vocal in supporting Protestant power militarism in Northern Ireland, while others absolutely disavowed such violence. It's not a, hardly a homogeneous group, is it? Ideologically, it was very heterogeneous. There was huge diversity in the religious views, the political views. But in terms of its demographics, these men were all from a white working class background. And I suppose if you wanted to point to one ideological commonality beyond the obvious Protestant only membership. The second commonality would, of course, be political unionism. Thousands of orange men and women flocked to Edinburgh this morning in stout defence of the union. Mr. Salmon, you will not pawn the loyal Protestant people of Scotland. No to independence and no surrender to separatism. But organisers of the cross party official Better Together campaign have refused to have anything to do with the Orange Order. Their strong religious ties, they fear, would not help the no cause. Protestant faith defenders proclaimed one banner on the march. Protestant action, no popery, said another. You're carrying an anti-Catholic banner. You say it says no popery. I'm against the incorrect teachings of the Catholic Church, but I'm not any Catholic. Well, Catholics are likely to take it as hostile, aren't they? Oh, I can't... And, 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 and the effects of a march like this will make people, Catholics vote yes? I don't think so. I don't think people are that shallow. I was a bit surprised that you found it well, relatively easy to get in to the members of the Orange Order because it, it does have a reputation of being something of a of a secret society. Gaining access to both the hierarchy and grassroots members was uh, easier than I had anticipated. The executive officer at the time was clear that he had what he called an open door policy. Now you're right, the Orange Order simultaneously has a reputation for being what many people regard to be a secret uh, society. The earliest founders of Orangism were Freemasons and the ritual within Orangism is strongly Masonic. But when I asked uh, Orangemen who I met during my ethnographic research whether or not they felt the Orange Order was a secret society, they scoffed and said, well, no, because a secret society would hardly parade its members through Edinburgh and Glasgow, would it? Yet, on the other hand, they also said that they were a what they called a society with secrets. And what they meant by that was that they did have uh, aspects of their uh, ritual life that they would not share with uh, non-members. And they also had what they called uh, a grip, what would more typically be called a secret handshake used to uh, identify each other as members. So as a non-member, I was never able to observe the, ini the initiation ritual called the Royal Arch Purple, the second degree for myself. So as a result, I was reliant on using already published secondhand sources. Basically what happens in that ritual is that Orangemen reenact the desert wanderings of the ancient Israelites as described in the biblical book of Exodus. Do they believe that they are similarly persecuted? Do they similarly believe they are among the elect few who will eventually triumph? Whilst all of the grassroots Orangemen that I spent time among would be quick to affirm that the Protestant people of Britain have a distinct type of favour placed upon them by God. Others took that sense of Protestant election, Protestant specialness a step further by uh, embracing what is known historically as British Israelite theology. And for these members, their sense of being part of 
Israel, part of ancient Israel, was taken uh, quite literally. Others drew on their own footballing loyalties and, for instance, the Rangers chant, we are the people, to embellish and claim a, a kind of strong and direct affinity with Israel as the people, as the chosen people. You do point out that numerous members that you came across rarely went to church at all, but they also refer to what they describe as the menace of Rome. For well, the grassroots orangemen who I spent time with, church attendance was not essential to sustaining uh, a Protestant identity because they regarded their Protestantism to be in their blood, literally in many cases. Instead, what was essential in their view, defending against this menace of Rome, by which they meant seeking to resist papacy, the idea that the Roman Catholic Church as an institution was not merely religious, but had enormously powerful and in their view nefarious political ambitions to control Scotland, whether it be through the education system or the media or through uh, banking and finance. So I met some informants, some Orangemen, who were very clear to me that Rangers had enemies not only in Celtic Football Club, but within the, in their view, again, the Catholic uh, Republican population in Scotland at large. You did find some striking differences, didn't you, between the Orange Order hierarchy and the, the rank and file members. I think it's a distinction which uh, one uh, scholar, Elaine McFarland, has contrasted between rough and respectable Orangism. Tell me about this division. The hierarchy seeks to present a relatively tolerant and progressive view of Orangism, a view of Orangism which is sober-minded and charitable, one that seeks to defend civil and religious liberties for all, that contrasted really strongly with the Orangism of the grassroots. Many of the men who I met in the Orange Social Club were clear with me that they personally identified as uh, people of anti-Catholic opinion. Some even described themselves openly as bigots who hated Roman Catholics, and they were unwilling to apologize for that enmity that they felt towards the Catholic Church and towards Catholic individuals because they felt that Catholicism had made itself the enemy of Orangism and therefore it was their duty, it was their responsibility to respond in kind and to resist uh, this papal threat as they saw it, however they could. For many people they'll be thinking of the sort of Celtic Rangers matches when you actually looked at this, um, you didn't necessarily find out that there was a great deal of violence. It was limited almost to, to chanting. The old firm clash between Celtic and Rangers is a fundamental part of how sectarian identity is played out in Scotland. And many Orangemen were dedicated Rangers supporters. And during my research, there was a very significant public debate attempting to limit sectarian chanting but the point here is that that type of sectarian chanting that you typically see featured in newspaper headlines whenever there is a Celtic Rangers match misses the main point that the strongest examples of sectarianism are typically expressed in the absence of rival fans or uh, in the case of football stadiums when they're separated by large distances through police cordons. And my point really is that understanding that type of football sectarianism really involves noticing that sectarian chanting attempts to create bonds of fraternity and sociality within your own group rather than seeking primarily to enrage the opposing fan base. You attempt to produce some sort of alliance between your own liberal ethics, if you like, and a world of people which really seem to be characterised by prejudice and uh, by a very limited 
point of view on the world. I think I, as an anthropologist, had to learn how to empathise with oranges and by forcing myself to step into their world. And I, as a result, spent a lot of time listening to grassroots orangemen in an attempt to understand why they were doing what they were doing, why they were saying such um, bigoted things, why they were uh, embracing football rivalries, why they relished confrontational parading. And in order to understand that, I also sought to work out where my own uh, dividing lines were, how I created in-groups and out-groups in my own thinking, in my own um, political allegiances. My point is that the effect is the same. The reality is that even for people of liberal convictions, in-groups and out-groups and sadly condemning the other is still a fundamental part of how human beings make sense of who they are in relation to who they aren't. And there we must stop. Joseph Webster, thank you very much. I love the old fam man. Two sets of fat people singing about famine. <laughs> You'll never replace the hatred without rangers, will you? You'll never get back to the same level of hatred without rangers, even if you had a Muslim partic thistle. <laughs> the Catholics and the Muslims would just bond over their mutual hatred of orange outfits. <laughs> We're six points behind, boys, but we'll claw it back over Ramadan. Irene <laughs> Bigond, Senior Lecturer in Irish Studies at Aix-Marseille University. And she now joins me. Deep. Now, it was steeped in anti-Catholic sectarianism from the outset, and I think it was banned several times in the 19th century. It was. So tell me a little bit about its, its revival at the turn of the century and the extent to which anti-Catholicism is absolutely central to the order. The revival took place at the end of the 19th century in the context of the debate about home rule. Uh, when there was this question of setting up a separate parliament in Ireland, uh, which of course would have been dominated by uh, the majority, the Catholic majority. And so uh, the Orange Order at that time was revived and associated with uh, Unionists in Westminster and was instrumental in creating the Unionist Party, which went on to oppose the three Home Rule Bills. People knew there was a potential for sectarian violence more than just political action. It was also uh, at the time of the third Home Rule Bill in 1913, it was involved in arming uh, people and there was a lot of overlap with the Ulster Volunteer Force which was created at the same time. You cite some research from 2007-8 which involved interviewing more than 1,300 Orange members about their positions on religious issues. Now, 72% disagreed or strongly disagreed that the order was hostile to Catholic believers. 57% of the panel agreed or strongly agreed it was hostile to the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. We've got another finding here, 81% of these people, Orange people, who were interviewed said they wouldn't be happy if their children married Catholics. I mean, it seems to be something to do really with with the people rather than the doctrines of the church well they define themselves as a protestant institution and they say well we're a protestant association so why should we engage with the catholic community uh, we want to defend protestant faith and protestant values now to explain unionism to you unionism to be fair is simply the belief that two small pretty similar countries might be better off together, unless those countries are both part of Ireland. They came in their thousands from Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK and marched shoulder to shoulder with their Scottish counterparts. It is abundantly clear that whether it be Ardstraw or Ayr, Donegal or Dundee, Londonderry or Livingstone, Belfast or Bells Hill, the unmistakable message emanating from the Orange fraternity is that we are better together than we are apart. The parade made its way through Edinburgh city centre, but not everyone was in support of either the message or indeed the disruption. I think it's a bit inappropriate at this particular moment. I just believe in local government rather than like somebody down in London who possibly doesn't really care so much about um, Scotland. So I think we should be in charge ourselves. We're just here to support them and show uh, Scotland that they are a part of Northern Ireland and we don't want to lose them. 
they know that uh, the union together is, is better than being an independent company. Yeah. What's your message to the people of Scotland today? Oh, no! no! It's anybody's guess whether today's parade actually affects how people will vote on Thursday. Other pro-union campaigners have described it as an unwelcome intervention, but the Orange Order itself says that today's the day the new no campaign finally got some passion. Lisa McAllister, BBC Newsline, Edinburgh. There are clearly many, many thousands, not just marching, but also out to see them. The organisers hoped it would be the biggest Orange March in Edinburgh for more than 60 years. Remarkably, it passed without any visible opposition from the Yes campaign or any trouble. The idea of today's procession is to make sure that our members, family and friends, that we galvanise a no vote so that there are no apathy and complacency come Thursday on the referendum day. But there are ban we saw one banner, it said no popery. It's not the sort of thing Catholics are going to like. They may well say, right, well, if that's what the no camp represent, I'm voting yes. Well, I didn't see the banner, banner no popery, but we would suggest that that banner shouldn't have been there today. Many have Scottish ancestors, and they do not like the Scottish National Party one bit. Alex Salmon, to me, is a, a born-again Jacobite. He's still living in the 17th century. Isn't it ironic?